Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Maren Aiken, and I've had the joy of working with the next four speakers in the Cave Environmental Group over the past year. Uh, first, starting us off, we have Sarah Conley presenting the effects of sulfate and chloride concentrations on metal iron retention on um, iron oxyhydroxide. Yeah. So, Sarah, whenever you're ready, have you can start. All right, hi everyone. As Miranda said, my name is Sarah Conley, and I'll be talking about how sulfate and chloride interact with the adsorption and desorption of metal ions onto iron oxyhydroxide nanoparticles. Uh, so, this right here is just an environmental example of why this matters. Uh, this is going to be an image of the Animas River in Colorado. This was these pictures were taken a day in between each other. One was a day before, and then one was the day after the U.S. Uh, decided to try to uh, clean the. There's a gold mine in this region, and they tried to take out the polluted water. When they ended up pouring three million gallons of this polluted water into this river, which caused this change of color. Uh, this change of color is caused by the fact that all this liquid that comes out of these mines is really acidic and causes a buildup of lead, which is what causes this orange color. So that was an example of acid mine drainage. Acid mine drainage is caused by acidic water from the mines being exposed to sulfide containing minerals within these environmental systems. And then these sulfide minerals undergo a chemical reaction with water and oxygen that produces sulfuric acid, which, which alters the pH of the water. Um, and then this sulfuric acid breaks down the minerals and rocks and exposes the area to a toxic metal waste. And these contaminated bodies of water have a very increased acidity and high metal concentration, which is an example of this is copper and zinc, which we'll be studying in this project. So the significance, why does this acid mine drainage matter? Uh, so in the top image, that's going to be an example of all this acidity building up causes a corrosion of infrastructure, causes a lot of rust to be to take place on different materials. And then it's also super harmful to surrounding populations to human health. An example of this is this copper and zinc specifically can cause increases in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, cancer, hypertension, melanosis lung diseases, and peripheral vascular diseases. And then additionally, obviously, these higher concentrations of metal are really toxic to the aquatic environment and can cause a lot of fish to die and cause a really big issue in these aquatic areas. Um, so how are we going to try to fix this? We decided to study gertite nanoparticles, which is a type of iron oxyhydroxide nanoparticle present in the environment already. So when you saw that orange in the first image from the river, that was an example of iron, iron building up in the uh, environment. And one of these types of iron is gertite nanoparticles. So why do we choose these? Uh, gertite nanoparticles, as you can see on that image to the left, super small particles. So they have very high surface area to volume ratio, which allows them to have very high adsorptive properties and high reactive sites. We also already know that they're stable in these natural systems because they're already naturally occurring, and they have selective adsorption properties for metals with positive charges like zinc and copper, which we will be looking at. So the objective of our project was to see how the addition of sulfate and chloride concentrations would alter the adsorption and desorption of copper and zinc ions onto these iron oxyhydroxide nanoparticles. We decided to study sulfate and chloride because these are also two and I have that are already present in these systems, and we want to see how that would alter, because there's been previous research done with just regular water, but we want to see how the addition of these would affect it. So our hypothesis was that with increasing chloride and sulfate concentrations, we would see an increase in metal adsorption to the nanoparticles and a decrease in metal desorption to the nanoparticles. So this is our methods. Uh, first step was to synthesize the nanoparticles. And then we would add these add metal ions to the solution in a dispersed suspension. And this would be when we add the zinc or copper to the suspension. And then we would increase the pH to either 6.5 for copper or 7.5 for zinc to allow for adsorption to take place because these are the ideal pH levels for adsorption to occur. 
Uh, then we would add, add different sulfate and chloride concentrations and shake that for a whole day and then have an adsorb sample. We would then take part of this adsorb sample, decrease the pH to about five to have desorption to occur, and then have another set of desorbed samples that we would test. And then our last step was to take all these samples and use ICP OES, which is a machine that allows us to determine the concentration of any samples that we have for a specific metal. So you'll create a concentrate concentration. Um, you'll use just a calibration curve and it'll help you determine what concentration of copper and zinc is still left over in that sample. So right here is an example of one of our data sets. Uh, so this is this is showing the effect of increasing sulfate concentration, which you'll see on that x-axis there. And as you can see, the sulfate concentrations go up to a max of 0 0.03 because this is the maximum molarity that's present in seawater. So we wanted to see how the change in a freshwater source would kind of change from that freshwater source into the salinity of a seawater. So we want to see how that would affect the adsorption of copper, which you'll see the amount of copper adsorbed onto the nanoparticle on that y-axis. And as you can see, with just small increases of sulfate, we have a pretty big uptake right away in the amount of adsorption. So you can see it goes from about around 80% up to about 90% with the addition of sulfate. So this shows us that sulfate does indeed like increase the adsorption. And then right here, this is gonna be the retention. Uh, so this is basically when we decrease that pH to five, how much of the copper stays on those nanoparticles. In this case, about 20% stayed on. And you can see this difference in between these curves. When we decrease that pH, we see a big decrease in the amount of copper adsorption the samples. Okay, and then this right here is gonna be, instead of the addition of sulfate, the addition of chloride. And as you can see, a pretty similar uh, relationship occurs. As soon as we add small amounts of chloride, we see that uptick in adsorptive and retention properties. And, but we can see when we compare the, the retention, which is the pink curves right there, between adding sulfate on the left and adding chloride in the middle, uh, we see that there's a much higher retention rate for those chloride um, additions. And then right here was when we added both chloride and sulfate to see how there was an additive effect. And we did, we did see that there was an additive effect between these uh, two additions. So as you can see, it goes from about, about like 30% up to almost 70%. And you can see um, if we add those two curves together, that is approximately what we get. So we know that they have an additive effect. We also can note that there's pretty similar absorption between all of these curves. We do see that with the addition of these anions, we do get an increase, but not a significant difference between the addition of sulfate or the addition of chloride. So here's our data for the same thing, but with zinc instead of copper. As you can see, pretty similar graphs here. Uh, let me just pull up the other ones. We see a very similar trend with zinc as we do with copper. Once again, the adsorption curves, which are those orange curves, we do see that difference between the adsorption and the desorption curves, but we also see that the adsorption curves are very similar from each different um, situation. We also see in those green curves that the retention once again increased from the addition of just the sulfate, which is on the left, and increases when we add just chloride, and then it was the highest with the addition of chloride and sulfate. So what are our conclusions? Uh, we saw very similar uh, data for both copper and zinc. So we concluded that the retention increased from the, the presence of just chloride, just sulfate, and the combination of sulfate and chloride was the greatest. We saw that adsorption, which was that top curves on those graphs, was not greatly affected by, the, in, by adding sulfate or chloride or the combination, but we did see when we added those amounts, we did get that uptake. And why? So we suspect that the ternary complexes on the surface of these nanoparticles is stabilized by the presence of sulfate and chloride, which causes um, a higher retention rate because these uh, nanoparticles are more tightly like grasped onto the metals, which makes them harder to take off when we um, desorb them. So future directions, 
would be we could re replicate this experimental design using other metal ions present in, in acid mine drainage. For example, lead is a very common um, metal that's in these environments. Could also test other anions. In this case, we use sulfate and chloride, but there's a bunch of other anions that are present in the environment. We just chose these ones because they're the most prominent and see if there's any rather other relevant anions that increase or decrease the adsorptive effects of metal ions on sugar type nanoparticles. And um, most importantly, continue remediation efforts to lower toxic metal exposure to these surrounding populations to be able to better help these populations have lower levels of those diseases and help the aquatic environments as well. Uh, so thank you so much for your attention. Let me know if you have any questions. What are the advantages to using nanoparticles in comparison to like other methods they use to clear water? Yeah, so uh, these nanoparticles specifically have a, such a small surface area to volume ratio that allows them to have such good adsorptive properties. So we do see higher levels of adsorption when compared to different uh, remediation efforts. There are a ton of different efforts, but we do know that these are already present in the environment. So they're non-toxic and already naturally occurring. So it's pretty easy to implement this into the environment. Yeah. What was the most challenging part of doing the research? Uh, I would say most challenging was had a lot of issues with one of the machines. That was super difficult, but Janelle helped me a lot with that. <laughs> uh, super great. But after getting through that, it was pretty good. Um, and then just working with the data analysis between those things was a little bit challenging, but once you're able to get a template, it's really easy to be able to figure that stuff out. Yeah. So I know nanoparticles in the environment, under different environmental conditions, tend to aggregate together and not change some of the properties of the nanoparticles. Do you expect that to change the absorption of copper and zinc to if they're aggregated versus dispersed? Yeah, so we would expect since aggregated uh, nanoparticles actually have a lower surface area, and since they're stuck together, they'll have a lower surface area, we would expect there to be a much lower adsorptive properties of those when compared to the ones we use suspended in solution. Great, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Another round of applause. We still have a few minutes before our next presenter. So if anyone has any questions or Sarah, she can answer them. Do you want me to say Oh, yeah. Just yeah, I think so. I think CK is in the office. I saw first entry when I was doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say the night. <laughs> 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 Is that in this room? Um, this room is the environmental science. Uh, so we're going to 
Can I am not presenting. Continuing the discussion on iron oxide hydroxide in the particle, um, specifically looking at the effect of ions on the interpretive properties. Hello. So, as you heard, my name is Sebastian, and for the past two semesters, I've been working with Sarah Connolly on observing the effects of anions on the absorptive properties of iron oxide hydroxide anions. And just to begin, I kind of want to show this schematic here of an abandoned mine that we find in Great Britain, just to see how damaging abandoned mines can be. Um, this mine was created 2,000 years ago, but it's still having adverse effects on the environment through acid mine drainage, which, as Sarah explained, is basically a collection of toxic heavy metals that are leaked out into the surrounding environment and uh, can be especially devastating if they make their way to local communities. And then in the picture on the right, we have a more practical view of how this acid mine drainage can affect the environment. Uh, we can obviously see the discoloration of this little stream right here, and that is not natural. Um, so this discoloration is mainly due to the metals that are in the drainage, uh, mainly due in this case to iron. 
And one possible way we were looking into remediating this situation was through the use of iron oxyhydroxide nanoparticles. Uh, we chose these nanoparticles due to their unique characteristics, such as their natural surface reactivity, their high surface area, and their small size, which makes them really good uh, remediators for these types of environments. They're naturally occurring in uh, the environment as well, where they take the form of gritite and fairy hydrite. And in the picture to the right, we can see an environment that is once again affected by acid mine drainage. However, in this picture, uh, the logs have become coated in fairy hydrate. So it just kind of shows that although this environment isn't doing so good, uh, fairy hydrate is still available and uh, potentially able to remediate uh, some of the damage that is being done. Um, previous studies have shown that these nanoparticles can uptake the potentially harmful metals that are present, but we know that this process is influenced by a lot of factors uh, such as pH and salinity. So our group uh, in specific chose a situation in which uh, this acid mine drainage kind of leaked out into a nearby body of water and then eventually made its way to a more marine environment um, such as the ocean. So because of that, we chose to study two anions, uh, namely chloride and sulfate, that are most abundant in seawater. And previous studies uh, within the group have shown that varying chloride concentrations can influence retention of metals to the nanoparticles, but we kind of wanted to uh, investigate further the magnitude of this effect. And in terms of the metals that we were studying, we chose copper and zinc because we believe that they were a little bit understudied in terms of the metals that were present in the acid mine drainage. A lot of literature uh, tends to focus on metals such as lead, uh, cadmium, and other heavy metals that are present. But as we saw in the previous presentation, um, excessive amounts of copper and zinc can still lead to adverse health effects. And so just to summarize, before we began our experimentation, our question was, how is adsorption and retention between these heavy metal ions, in this case copper and zinc, affected by the presence of chloride? And our group hypothesized that chloride retention will be promoted, uh, or I'm sorry, metal ion retention will be promoted in the presence of chloride up until a certain threshold concentration is reached. However, this amount of metal uh, retained will not exceed the level found when using artificial seawater. And so uh, my methods were very similar to Sarah's in that we began with gritite synthesis and nanoparticle aggregation before moving on to absorption experiments, uh, which we can see in the right with little schematic. Uh, we began with a dispersed nanoparticle solution that contained either zinc or copper, and we increased the pH of the suspension to 6.5 for uh, copper and 7.5 for zinc and then allow that uh, to rest on the shaker for about 24 hours before introducing chloride to the suspension, and then waiting another 24 hours for those interactions to take place. And then once this set uh, amount of time had been uh, elapsed, then we had our adsorb sample. Uh, from this adsorb sample, we took a small amount of it and decreased the pH to about five and uh, allowed that to rest for about four hours on a shaker where we then got our desorb sample from that. And then after uh, we had both of our samples, we prepared them uh, for analysis via inductively coupled uh, plasma optical emission spectroscopy, or ICPOES. And we prepared these samples by first centrifuging for 15 minutes at 3000 RPM. And then the supernative was decanted, filtered through a 0.2 uh, micrometer filter, and then acidified to a level of about two. And then all samples underwent analysis uh, with ICPOES, which is seen right there as well. And then to get into the conclusion or the results of this experiment, I have two graphs right here, which essentially show the same data. Uh, the graph on the right has just been linearized to show uh, what's going on in the clusters of data at lower chloride concentrations. So on the x-axis, we have uh, chloride and artificial seawater concentration that's expressed as a percent, where 100% is equal to 0.6 molar chloride because that's the amount uh, or the concentration of chloride that is present in actual seawater. 
And then on the y-axis, we have the percent of zinc that was adsorbed or retained. And then in terms of trends that we can see from the graph, we see that even with the introduction of small amounts of chloride to the solution to the suspension, uh, there's a sharp increase in the amount of retention and adsorption uh, between the metal and the nanoparticle. Uh, this sharp increase in, uh, went on until a chloride concentration of about 15%, where it then uh, plateaued but still increased uh, steadily. And then also to note here is that the amount of chloride retained by the nanoparticles was less than the amount retained uh, when the nanoparticles were in a suspension containing artificial seawater as well. And then moving on to copper, uh, we have the same uh, layout in terms of the graph where the red has been linearized in the same fashion. On the x-axis, we still have chloride and artificial seawater concentration uh, expressed as a percentage. And on the y-axis, we have copper uh, percentage that was adsorbed or retained by the nanoparticles. Uh, we largely see a similar trend uh, when compared to zinc in that uh, low concentrations of chloride introduced to the suspension. It increased the amount of metal that was retained and absorbed by the nanoparticle. Uh, this also increased until about 15 to 20 percent, where, then, where it then began to plateau. However, whereas zinc reached its maximum then at 100 percent of chloride concentration, uh, copper reached its maximum at around 75 percent chloride concentration. And also to note from these two graphs right here is that the chloride or the amount of metal retained in the chloride solution was more than the amount retained in the solution containing artificial seawater. And then just to get a picture of what's going on at a molecular level, uh, we have a conceptual model here uh, using zinc. Uh, we see in the orange that it, that represents the nanoparticle uh, with the iron in the middle and the oxygen on the edge. And the oxygen is actually what's binding to the metal in this case, uh, and the chloride is stabilizing this interaction. So that's why we see an increased retention when we introduce chloride to the suspension, because chloride is stabilizing uh, this interaction between nanoparticle and metal. And if we were to change out zinc for copper, we would largely see the same thing. Uh, one key difference, though, would be that chloride would interact a little more with the surface of the nanoparticle. Uh, this would reduce electrostatic <laughs> repulsion between the metal and the nanoparticle, and therefore allow the metal to be retained more easily. So that is also another reason that we see increased retention uh, in copper when chloride is introduced to the suspension. And to get into the conclusions, um, we see that increased concentrations of chloride increased the amount of metal that was adsorbed and retained by the nanoparticles. In a more practical sense, um, if we were to migrate to more saline environments, such as the ocean, desorption is not anticipated and metal ion retention should be enhanced. And then copper ions are better retained in brackish environments, whereas zinc is more retained in marine environments. And then for future work, a couple of experiments that we could go into would be determining if or why copper is better retained in environments only containing chloride, and also examining the effects of other ions in seawater, such as magnesium and sodium. And I'd like to thank my lab members for their support, for Chapman and Seaweed for funding the project. And that's all for me, but if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Okay, if you probably, I know you know so much more now than when you first started your project. Sure. If you were to go back and change anything about your project, what would you go back and change anything? Probably being more consistent with the amount of time that the suspensions are allowed to shake. Because technically there's a range that it's supposed to shake between 18 and 24 hours, but it should be pretty consistent. 
And I think that I could have done a better job keeping that at the same time. So shaking your suspension of the particles metal and correct. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Can you go back to your zinc figure? The oh. sorry. Yep. What do you think is in the artificial seawater that increases retention in your zinc over chloride? Is there a specific anion? Or what um, anions are present in the artificial seawater that you want to target? On? I would assume that's probably the effect of other um, ions that are also present in seawater. I guess another one would probably be sulfate, mm -hmm. like Sarah showed. Mm -hmm. So I. Uh, Based on intuition, I would assume this is probably because sulfate and chloride are probably interacting in that uh, same matter as Sarah showed earlier. Okay. And then I know you mentioned as part of your future direction to see another and add to sea water. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? Give Sebastian another round of applause. Take a slow break before we continue on with our presentations. Class 10 10. Get into more coffee, but I think there's someone in our. I attend at the high school event. High schoolers. The high schoolers are here. I think you could probably still walk in and. Probably, you can just tackle you on the place. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There are very there's suspicious reason. And I got a good situation. Because this is like when you're doesn't look like it's the most go thing. And I always want to say G. Oh, yeah. I actually don't know. I need some. And he's German. Is my hypothesis. Oh, yeah, sorry. I didn't hear you. Yes, I'm not sure. What plans in your events do you have next to be? Okay, well, I don't know all this evening, but it's time for Oh, really? You're all here all day, then? Yeah. Oh, that's well. Hopefully, I just get a camera. Right for sure. Right for sure. It's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah, the buffet eggs are really good. Yeah. And they're pretty good. So yeah. I'm right. <laughs> 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 She's back. She's back. Let's go. Now you can just have your capstone paper. The easiest part, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
The person, the, the fact that the screen so high. Yeah. It's so interesting how you can so decrease that you have to practice. And how'd you got to practice in this room before you? Yeah, it's bizarre. It's not bizarre. Oh, you gotta it's different than the conference yeah. rooms. That's yeah. the yeah. 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 Oh, the 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 started um, continuing our Kim Environmental Group first half of the day session. We have Tao V presenting her work on the absorption of veins onto vertite and vertite coated sands. Uh, v, whenever you are ready, you can go ahead and start. Thank you, Marina. Um, hi, everyone. My name is V, and today I'll be talking about the absorption of manganese onto vertite and vertite coated sand um, with the effects of sodium chloride and we simulate oceanic sodium. So the term salinity refers to the uh, content of dissolved salt in our water system, and it highly contributed to the unique chemical properties of our seawater, and uh, it facilitates many biological processes in our marine ecosystem. So according to this table over here, you can see sodium chloride dominates most of our saline composition. Uh, actually, if you kind of like take a liter of seawater and evaporate all the water out and somehow being able to tell the difference between the different um, salt grains there, about 58.49% of them is um, sodium chloride grade. So I thought that was cool. Um, and these are the different uh, water sources we have on our planet and uh, they all vary in uh, different sodium chloride concentration. From fresh water to about brackish water, have about 0 0.0 molar to 0.2 molar of, of sodium chloride content. From brackish water to ocean water, varies about 0.2 to 0.6 molar. Under extreme conditions such as the Dead Sea, um, the sodium chloride content can go up to 1 molar. And uh, we're going to be testing throughout this whole range of salinity 
to be to ensure that um, the to ensure the effects of solidity on our adsorption is um, is matching with our environmental condition. And even though uh, salinity is important for our biological ecosystem, it also increases the contaminant side of our trace metal contaminants. And one of those is actually manganese. Uh, manganese is a natural occurring element. It evolves from uh, volcanic eruptions, weathering erosion happening naturally. But uh, recently, steel production and mining also contributed to the amount of manganese added in into our environment. Even though manganese as a micronutrient in our in our body at low concentration, it helps facil facilitate a lot of uh, the production of white blood cell and glucose attacking our body. But at high concentration and high exposure time, it can actually pose a potential health risk such as um, kidney failures, but birth defects or other neurosystem um, disorder. Manganese is a highly redox element. As you can see on this table over here, under oxy condition with the presence of oxygen, it can precipitate two manganese oxides, which is a precipitate that can get into our water sources and eventually into our drinking water. However, the uh, manganese oxide can be reduced down to our dissolved manganese via the presence of iron or other um, absorbing surface and being adsorbed onto the surface, hoping to remove the uh, manganese content in our uh, water source. <clears throat> and in this, in this experiment, we'll be uh, looking into gertite. Gertite is a form of iron oxyhydroxide that is very abundant in our environment, highly found in sand or soil in like dry environment, and is very thermodynamically stable. So it doesn't change its form. Um, throughout time. And uh, these gertide also existed in like coated particles such here. You can see it kind of like the, the yellowish coating on the sand. That's actually gertide being coated on the sediment. So we'll look at into like the effects of just the gertide and how the effect of coating affects the, uh, the absorption capacity of our substrate, which poses our question how the salinity con condition affects the absorption of, uh, of manganese onto iron hydroxide surfaces. And to do so, we uh, synthesized gertite in the lab and are, we coated it with uh, the silica quartz sand. And we uh, performed different uh, characterizations such as uh, sand digestion to, uh, to get the total amount of iron coated onto our sand. We did uh, surface imaging using the scanning electron microscope, and uh, we do the surface analyzing using our VET. To perform the adsorption experiment, uh, we make a stock solution of sodium chloride and manganese, and we add that to our little vacuum tube, and we top that to about 50 ml and adjust that to the pH of around 6. That's the normal pH of uh, water to like, sea water. And we suspend that for about an hour. After we prep them for uh, centrifuge, prep them for analysis by centrifuging the can and acidify it down to about pH of two. And uh, we repeat this entire procedure in an anaerobic chamber. The reason being, as I mentioned earlier, under oxid condition, manganese can oxidize into manganese oxide. So we want to prevent that from happening and also looking into how much actually get precipitated out of our solution versus how much actually get uh, adsorbed onto our surface. That's the glove bag. Here's a picture of me working in a glove bag. <laughs> so uh, these images are taken from the SEM of our gertite and our gertite coated sand, which you can see the surface area of gertite is so much bigger than the surface area of our gertite coated sand. Um, the picture on the actual product also does adjust it. You see gertite is like much more powdery versus gertite coated sand to look like normal sand. And here's the result of our adsorption experiment. On the right is under oxy condition, and on the left is under anoxy condition. Uh, and on the y, on the x-axis is the, is the uh, concentration of sodium chloride added into the solution versus the amount of manganese actually being removed in uh, micromolar per meter square of our substrate. 
So uh, we can see that the amount of manganese being removed increases as we uh, increase the amount of sodium chloride in our solution on both uh, surface gerti and gerti coated sand. And uh, we can slightly see that under oxygen condition, the amount of manganese removal is slightly higher compared to uh, under anoxic condition. And uh, gerti coated sand it can actually remove more manganese compared to just our plain gerti. So uh, first we'll talk about how the salinity enhances the removal of manganese. When I first started this experiment, uh, I sort of have this hypothesis where I think the amount of manganese will be removed will remove more based on the increase of sodium chloride. And what I've read is because of these formation of um, manganese chloride tertiary complexes. So to test that hypothesis, we actually use this, uh, a model called geochemistry geochemical workbench. And what they do is they, uh, they tell us the dominating species in our solution based on our uh, certain conditions. So in this case, we added chloride to see how what's kind of like the dominating species in our solution at that time. And we can see that most of uh, our species in our solution is the dissolved manganese ion and not so much of the uh, manganese chloride complexes. So yes, it does um, contribute to the increase of manganese uh, removal in our uh, solution, but it doesn't dominate the effects of it. Instead, uh, the reason why salinity enhances the manganese removal is due to the increase of ionic strength of the solution. Uh, our, once we added chloride in, chloride has like a, sort of like a negative charge, and that chloride got onto the surface of our substrate, which made our substrate surface a lot more negative compared to what it already is. And that attracted the uh, positive charge manganese, which enhances the removal of manganese from the solution. Second, I'll be talking about the presence of oxygen uh, enhances the precipitation of manganese oxide. We saw from the graph earlier that it does remove more manganese under oxygen condition, but the amount is very small. And an um, explanation to that is because although we have oxygen presence, we also have iron present, which help reduce the manganese back to our manganese 2 ions right here. So we can see that under oxygen condition, manganese oxide uh, do exist, but it also get reduced back. And we can conclude that under oxygen condition, the uh, absorption and precipitation adds up to the amount of removal versus under anoxic condition, only uh, absorption will be happening. And last but not least, uh, we saw that the increase of absorption uh, observed on vertex coated sand is higher. And this is because due to the reactive surface that the coating does. Uh, on the picture on the right is the uh, crystalline structure of vertex. As you can see, it's like packed very uh, closely to each other. Therefore, the, uh, a lot of the adsorptive site is being um, high behind or not being available out to the uh, surface versus under vertex coated sand. A lot of them are packed very loosely, so therefore created a lot more of the adsorptive um, site and eventually increases our, our adsorptive capacity of our sand. So just to conclude that's the experiment, we saw that vertex coated sand has a more reactive surface, which um, result in our um, higher removal observed. A solid condition enhances the removal of manganese due to mineral surface charge um, neutralization, which attract the um, manganese 2 plus ion. And last but not least, oxygen presence uh, promote manganese removal due to the precipitation of dissolved uh, manganese 2 to manganese oxide. But again, I, like I said, um, this uh, occurrence is very small, so it's highly negligible. And uh, the overall, this experiment potentially offers a solution to remove um, manganese contaminant off our groundwater system using natural condition and natural uh, occurring substrate. And this experiment could not be done without our Keg Lab member, of course, um, Dr. Kim and Dr. Miranda for supporting. Thank you a lot, Dr. Keller, for letting us our, use our glove bag. And, um, Chapman Center of Undergraduate Excellence uh, for funding our research. And that concludes my presentation.
think the presence of oxygen or the or not having any oxygen affects the absorption. Um, going, I guess, going back to this uh, cycle over here, uh, even though the presence of oxygen does um, oxidize our manganese, but we also have iron presence in our um, in our solution, which then reduces it back to manganese. Um, to yes. I'm going to follow up on that, if that's okay. So in a natural environment, when you were anoxic, all your manganese would be in manganese 2, right? And all your iron would also be in iron 2. And so if you have, so, but then when you add oxygen to the environment, all your iron 2 would also go back to iron 3, right? Because iron's also redox active. And so is it ever, so you're saying that it gets oxygenated and then the manganese precipitates out, but then there's iron two presence to reduce the manganese again. And I'm just curious how you think about an oxygenated environment also have an iron two in it. Because it seems like in most cases, if it's oxygenated, all the iron would also be oxidized. And so that left side of that diagram would be closed down, right? Um. But I guess we can also say that the iron also get reduced back. It's like a cycle and a cycle. So there still be iron too um, present under oxygen condition, which is more or less compared to ion oxygen. Okay, I see. Yes. Uh, great presentation. Thanks for that. What would you do as a follow-up study to this? Um, so for future plan, um, if I were to continue this project, I would uh, look at other iron oxyhydroxide surfaces. Ferry hydride is one of them I'm looking into since um, ferry hydride is just like the less thermodynamic stable of gertide, mm -hmm. and over time, ferry hydride will eventually transform into gertide. So I just want to look into like how does the thermodynamic stability affect the adsorption capacity? That's one of the options. Is it the, the one where you show all the water levels, the levee levels, the kind of water? There we go. So which one has the most manganese? Should you want to focus on one of them? Manganese actually uh, has all of these water sources all, ha all has manganese in it. It's just, they interact with our water and with our soil. Where our sand, like even the Dead Sea, they have some sort of sand in it, and they have they still have some sort of dissolved mineral. And then again, manganese is like a dissolved mineral, just like zinc, copper, iron, it's like everywhere. Thank you so much, V, for your great presentation. We still have a few more minutes before our last presentation at uh, 10 30 so we'll take a five minute break and reconvene it
Do you have like any front, like specific shenanigans? I guess it's not that stupid. Yeah. 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 Or the that's our head lab dinner. Yeah. Um, Wait, when's our shit one? Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay, it's the Monday. Okay, it's Monday. Yeah. Okay, it's next week or next week or two two calls. I think this upcoming. Okay, is like on Monday. Yeah. Wait, do we know where? Huh? No. I did not see. What do you guys go for? Boston. Did you say Sarah? I said, what'd you vote for? They were all pretty solid options. So I was like, yeah, I just yeah. Boss Cat's good. Nothing? Yeah. I'm going to take it from you for sure. I'm just kidding. It's going to be busy. I know, I'm going to have to make some action soon. We have like 20 words. Yeah. Six, 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 six. It's fun to learn this green. It's like, yeah, not the in presentation button. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, My name is Jim. Yeah. Uh, this is a name. 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 This is a Oh, we don't have to do Um, we just up our first half of the day. We have um, another cake member, James Hazen, presenting his work on the engagement of women and different moral services under different environmental conditions. Uh, James, whenever you're ready, you can begin your presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, again, my name is James Hazen, and I'll be talking about the effects of pH and oxygen on the removal of manganese from groundwater using different moral services. Um, so, as B previously mentioned, uh, Manganese is a micronutrient at lower concentrations, um, but also can be toxic at higher concentrations, and it can lead to um, a variety of different adverse self effects. Um, and also, as you mentioned, it enters the environment um, through a, a few different ways. Um, for example, some of them are one of 
A couple of examples are mining and mineral processing. Um, so pictured on the, the right side um, is a is a manganese not nodule. Um, it's just comprised of iron iron oxides and um, manganese oxides, and this particular one formed at the bottom of the seafloor. And as I mentioned earlier, I will be talking um, in the context of of groundwater. So in the in the picture just below that is kind of a cross section of a body of water, where at um, near the surface of the water you have a fully oxygenated water. Um, but as you go deeper, you you start to decrease in the level in the levels of oxygen. Um, in this particular experiment, we went from we we are our two main or our two uh, conditions are just fully oxygenated and then um, with the and then the fully absence of oxygen. So that's oxic and anoxic. Um, and manganese is important to talk about because it has this redox cycle. Redox is short for um, reduction oxidation. So oxidation can is represented by this red arrow where you have this manganese solution that is then oxidized to a solid form. And oxidation occurs when the when the element um, loses electrons. And then from the from sorry from the solid form, it can be then be reduced back to the aqueous form, um, where microorganisms will take over the process. And this is called reduction, where the um, the atoms will actually gain back those electrons. Um, in the context of groundwater, this is important, especially in your mines, because uh, in that wastewater, you can also have other uh, redox sensitive elements, such as arsenic or chromium. And arsenic is very important um, for this particular topic because as manganese is oxidized, that can actually also reduce the arsenic. And reduced forms of arsenic is even more, um, arsenic, as we know, is, is a poison. And it is even more toxic at these reduced well, at these in these reduced states. So going over some experimental parameters, as I mentioned earlier, I'll be using groundwater so, uh, groundwater conditions. Um, and groundwater has a pH between six and eight point five. And as I mentioned earlier, it can um, it can exist in oxic and anoxic conditions. I'll also be I will I will also be using three um, mineral surfaces. One of them is gertite. Which we've heard a lot about today. Um, <laughs> is a is an iron oxyhydroxide and is very common in the environment, and that's the reason why I'm using it. It also has a very high surface area. Um, the other two I'll be using are kaolinite and bentonite. They are two different types of clays, and I will be using them for the very same reasons because they are very common in the environment, and they um, also have a very high surface area. Um, Another parameter I'll be doing is normalizing all of my data. I will be um, doing surface area normalization, and that is um, to move, to test the object. That's to move on to the objective, which is to actually test the chemical properties of these different of these different mineral surfaces. One of these chemical properties is point zero charge. Um, point zero charge can be thought of be thought of as a surface charge, and it is what it actually is. It is the pH. It is the pH where all of the positive charges and all the negative charges on the surface are, are the same. So the surface itself is essentially neutral. And I'm looking to see if this plays a role in manganese removal from groundwater. Um, so to start off, we were we first synthesized our gertite using um, the alkaline procedure from, Swart, from Schwartman and Cornell. Um, this is where we combine solutions of calcium hydroxide and iron nitrate to form gertite. Um, I also measure the point of zero charge, as I mentioned, which is what I talked about earlier. And this is done through an acid-based titration. And lastly, I use BET to measure the actual surface area. It is important to note that we got our new BET pictured here at, um, near the middle of the semester. So before then, we actually had to uh, um, estimate the surface, the surface area of the different minerals. And this led to some minor problems that I'll get to later. Um, but for the actual experiment, I started with a known concentration of manganese. Um, I would add that to a measured amount of gertite, of gertite bentonite or kaolinite, just any of the middle surface that we're using. And then I would, I would adjust the pH um, to that of groundwater. 
I would then top that up to 50 mils and let it shake for an hour and then prep that for prep that for analysis. And the ICP would actually um, give back the amount of menus as leptis solution. So because we know what we started with and we know what we ended with, we can then calculate how much was removed. Um, and then this entire process was repeated uh, for the anaerobic chamber, um, very similar to uh, to these procedures. And an anaerobic chamber is just a vinyl bag that is filled with nitrogen and a small amount of hydrogen to then, and the hydrogen is used to sequester any um, small amounts of oxygen that is, um, that is present. So here's a table uh, of the point zero charge um, and surface areas that I measured. But it's important to note that Gertite, um has a point zero charge of 8.5, and that falls into the range that we are looking at. And so does Bednik, has a, has a point zero charge of 6.7, um, which again is in that range. Kilonite does not have a point zero charge that falls in that range. So as I mentioned earlier, we had to uh, estimate the surface area, and then later on we, we actually calculated, we actually measured it using our new VET, um, which is why I actually listed the approximate surface areas that was introduced into the mixture, because it was the original idea was to add the same amount of surface area, but uh, having looked at, having measured this, the actual specific surface area, which is reported in meters squared per gram, we found that that night actually was, a much, was much lower than we thought. For Gerta and Kilonite, this isn't, isn't really a problem, but for that night, there is, um, it's a slight issue. <laughs> so here is the, um, so on the left, so here are two graphs um, with the optic data and the anoptic data. And for both of them, on the x-axis, we have pH, and on the y-axis, we have manganese removal measured in uh, milligrams of manganese per meter squared of, of surface that was added. In the optic conditions, we can see that the bentonite um, removes, removes a lot, as well as in the anoxic conditions. It removes more than um, the other surfaces. So this is indicative that that bentonite is the most reactive of the three surfaces that I tested. Um, and it's also harder to see, but in the anoxic conditions, kaolinite removes more than gertite does. So this is so this can kind of show that um, in order of reactivity it goes. So the most reactive is bentonite followed by kaolinite and then gertite. Um, also seen between these two graphs when you're comparing them. In the oxic conditions, there is a lot more that is removed um, per, um, per surface area uh, when compared to the anoxic conditions. So this leads to um, the main conclusion for this particular slide that oxygen influences um, influences manganese removal. And this is because in the presence of oxygen, manganese will actually precipitate out. Um, if you remember back from that cycle, this is the, the red arrow. Um, which is precipitation. And as I mentioned earlier, it is harder to see what's happening um, at these lower uh, at these lower amounts of magnesium removal per surface area. Um, so I will be so in the next slide, I'll um, be looking specifically at what is in these two boxes here. So the graphs are going to be are going to be the same, um, but instead of going from zero to nine, it's going to go from zero to one, as you can see here. Um, so the graph on on the left is both kaolinite and gertite under oxic conditions, and we can see that um, at each pH level, the amount of manganese that is removed between the two surfaces or pretty much is very similar. Um, moving on to the middle graph, we can see that uh, when comparing oxic and anox anoxic conditions for for kaolinite, there is a not much change. There is they remove, uh, Kalanite removes similar amounts of manganese um, between these two conditions. And lastly, with Gertite, um, we see this very, we see this very smooth curve here in the anoxic conditions, and I'll talk about that later. But um, when comparing the Kalanite anoxic conditions and the Gertite anoxic conditions, it's also easier to see that Kalanite outperforms Gertite, um, which is why Again, as I mentioned earlier, um, that, that kaolinite is more reactive than gertite. Um, so moving back to the uh, to that smooth curve that we see in the gertite in the gertite under anoxic conditions, 
Um, that is due to the point zero charge, and I think it'd be easier to. Um, it would be easier to see this using this figure. Um, so moving from left to right, we are increasing in pH. And when we are below the point zero charge, the surface is mostly positive. Um, as we get to, uh, as we get towards the point zero charge, it's, it's um, neutral. And as we get closer, as you go above the point zero charge, it is more, more negative. And because manganese is a positive ion, as we increase in pH, there is um, more electrostatic interactions that are happening between the manganese ions and the mineral surface. So in conclusion, as pH increases, more, more manganese is removed from solution, but is also dependent on the chemical properties such as um, points of charge and surface, and surface charge, um, as well as the presence of oxygen. And lastly, I'd like to thank Dr. Kim and Dr. Aiken for their, for their mentorship throughout this project. I would like to thank um, my, fellow lab, my fellow lab members for their continued help and support. I would like to also thank Dr. Keller and the, and the Swamp Monsters Lab for their access to the NRO chamber that we used. And I would like to thank uh, Chapman Center of Undergraduate Ex Excellency for funding this project. Um, another great presentation. I'm super stoked to see all this anaerobic biogeochemistry happening in Chapman. <laughs> um, so the goal, this is going to be a really dumb question, so you can take it as you see fit. The goal is you want to get rid of reduced manganese from the system, right? Mm -hmm. And under oxic conditions, there's two places where that manganese can go. It can either precipitate out as manganese 4, mm -hmm. which takes it out of solution, which is great or it can get absorbed onto any of the various minerals that you have in your system. And the, the minerals have different levels of absorbing depending on all the stuff that you just talked about. Do I have that right so far? Yeah. Okay, so those two sinks for manganese two, are they both equally stable? So if you re, if, 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 this, if the system goes anaerobic, for, so you've got all the manganese out of solution now, some of it's on a mineral and some of it's just precipitated out itself, and now all of a sudden the system goes anaerobic for whatever reason. Does the manganese stay there in equal amounts once you reduce the conditions? Because the manganese four just by itself can get re-reduced by microbes to manganese two. Does the sorbed manganese stay sorbed if the system goes reduced or does it also get reduced and go back into solution? Is one a more permanent sink than the other is what I'm asking. That is not something that I tested, yeah. but I think that would actually um, be a really great direction where this project can go. Um, to first, for, I, I think I understand what you're saying, you first do the, um, the sorption steps under oxid conditions, and then take that same sample and move it to acid conditions. Do we have that correct? Yeah, right? And then maybe you throw in some microbes too, which I know chemists don't like to think about, but they, <laughs> they exist in aquifers, I promise. Um, yeah, it's like, is that how you would approach that question, is to then just re-reduce it and see what happens? Yeah, I think um, that would be a very interesting thing to see what would happen because uh, I would, from my understanding, I would think that the what is, has already been sorbed would stay there. But I, if manganese can get in there, maybe the microbes can also um, attack or uh, react with what is on the actual surface, not what's like in the pores of the, of the mineral surface, but like what's actually binding to the surface. Maybe it can. Um, uh, like react with what's just what's available, and then you possibly see some desorption. Great answer. Any other questions? Great presentation, James. I wonder if you might uh, backtrack a few slides. I want to see one of your results figures. Okay. Right there. Uh, yeah, on the right hand graph. Uh, your your measurements are looking pretty consistent, uh, except for bentonite anoxic at pH eight. Is there something special happening there that would cause that value to have uh, a threefold increase in manganese removal? So for that particular experiment, what happened was I don't think I removed all the oxygen before putting it into the anaerobic chamber. Um, because that particular experiment happened over spring break. And usually when I'm 
preparing to do this experiment. I'm also like interacting with other lab, other, um, lab members as I'm just gathering supplies and moving over to Dr. Kyle's lab. Because I was during spring break, that process was a lot shorter, um, which didn't allow all the oxygen to come out when I was um, sonicating the water that I would use. So I think that particular point, that particular point is due to um, some precipitation. Thank you. Okay, let's give James one more round of applause. And thank you to all the presenters in this section. Uh, it is now coffee break time, what they believe is an AF 101, not the one we had breakfast in, because that is full of high schoolers now. So um, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm going to ask all the King Club members to take for a picture, though, because Dr. Kim is really, really like that. <laughs> Uh, but welcome to, I guess, the second session, and this is all environmental science and policy students. <laughs> um, we're going to start off with Zoe. And so So if you don't know me, which sounds like a must be too, somehow, <laughs> um, my name is Zoe Von Holman, I'm the uh, my research on thermal inequities in Los Angeles County, specifically within recreational spaces. For this research, I focused on South and West LA specifically to provide um, part of analysis. Um, so just for some background, uh, I think it's important to understand what the concept of the urban PI is. Uh, which essentially is that in more urbanized areas where there's a lot of concrete and asphalt and these heat retaining materials, um, heat over the course of the day um, builds up and it's retained throughout the night, um, and it also reaches higher temperatures than it would in an area that has vegetation or green space. So I decided to look at South and West Los Angeles for my comparison um, because while they neighbor each other, they're very different um, in the demographics that they feature. Um, so. Uh, on the left here, I've shown income per capita. On the right, um, we've got some racial demographics. And generally, West LA is predominantly white um, and very affluent, while South LA is a lot more racially diverse and lower income. Uh, so the, the research that I was doing is part of a larger project um, that uh, focuses on environmental justice issues within Los Angeles County. Um, and part of that research process has been uh, members in the research process, uh, getting to know their concerns and their questions, and then diving into research from there. Um, so in conversations with community members from Southeast LA, which is not South LA, but it's, it's neighboring and we've got some very similar themes. Um, what was consistently brought up were um, some thermal themes, um, uh, issues of heat, or um, areas that were that were cool in so, um, uh, areas of artificial turf fields, sports fields were often um, a site that was uncomfortable to be in, whereas some parks could be um, a place where people could go to relax and cool down. Um, and this, uh, what was verbally um, explained, reflected the patterns that I'd begun to see in my preliminary analysis of South Los Angeles Heat Island. Um, so when it comes to looking at parks in the county, um, there have already been some examinations of inequities there. Um, Proposition K, which was passed in 1996, was an attempt to rectify some of those inequities, um, but uh, in terms of the allocation of funds, it ended up um, actually still favoring higher income areas, um, despite that intent. Um, in 2016, LA County itself conducted its own park needs assessment um, based on area of population and the amenities within those parks, um, and overall, South LA emerges the region most in need. So while these um, different examinations are definitely valuable, um, they both lack a central feature, which is heat, which is brought up by community members consistently as being a concern. Um, so this led me to my two central research questions, which were how do South and West LA differ in terms of the recreational space uh, constructed materials, whether that be um, is a park just like a concrete slab with some basketball line, or is it um, a swath of grass um, that might be a lot of alert. Um, and then that leads into what thermal disparities end up um, occurring because of those differences in material. So my methodology started with, as I mentioned, um, learning about the concerns and questions of community members, 
um, and then translating them to research that had to create a shape file basically and uh, that has all the boundaries of these different recreational spaces. Um, so for that, I had to adapt pre existing shape file from LA sanitation um, and add in additional recreation spaces, such as um, golf courses, and then take each of those spaces and break them down manually by material, um, which I will admit takes a really long time. <laughs> um, uh, so once I had my shape file, then I was able to add in data for that. So starting with material that I used um, a myriad of different um, additional sources to know what material was in each space. Um, that included um, both visual differentiation just through like Google Street View and publicly uploaded photos, as well as um, a sentinel vegetation layer um, that I could determine uh, whether a field was artificial or natural turf. Um, I also calculated uh, the area covered by each material uh, after um, differentiating each type, um, and then uh, noted which region each site was in. Uh, for that, I used the uh, differentiations used by the Los Angeles Times in their Mapping LA project, um, namely because they used in their um, in their drawings of the different boundaries input from community members as well. Uh, it's it's somewhat as you mentioned there. Um, somewhat of a you know, personal opinion sort of issue because it's not a hard and fast line. Um, and then finally, I input a temperature um, from EcoStress, which is a sensor on the International Space Station. Um, and uh, all of that went into the final analysis. So when it comes to material coverage, these two plots are the same, same data, um, just on different scales, so you can see it more easily. Um, because uh, this lower one, which is just a linear scale, um, see how drastically different um, the amount of natural turf is between these two spaces. Um, part of that's because there's a lot of natural open areas in the hills of West LA. Um, but even without that, we can compare um, the, the, two, uh, the two regions of materials that are more prevalent in each. So for South LA, um, it's more wood chips more present, um, rubber's more present, and concrete's more present, as well as artificial turf, all of these um, hotter materials. And then West LA is more sand and natural turf. Uh, so I zoomed, zoomed into a specific um, date, April 7th, 2022. Um, uh, EcoStress captures data at a variety of times a day um, at a fine resolution of 70 meters by 70 meters, which uh, allows for greater chance of capturing heat waves like this one. Um, so this, I ch chose this data to look at because it shows the upper range of temperatures that could be experienced. Um, as well as what might happen in heat wave conditions that are more increased, going to become more increasingly frequent um, with global warming. So in these insets, I've aligned um, different sites that are the um, hottest and coolest within um, West LA above and South LA below. Um, and you can see kind of visually that the hottest uh, pixels align with the artificial turf fields generally, and the cooler spaces in both um, are areas of natural turf. It's important to note here, however, that um, in South LA, the coolest region that was available um, was a golf course um, instead of an open park. Um, so generally what I found is that surface temperatures in recreational spaces are significantly higher in South LA than in the west side. Um, here I've just shown the distribution of those pixels. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but Mm -hmm. uh, there is a bump here, I swear. Um, it's just hard to see because there's so much more uh, natural turf in the west, uh, the west side. Um, but either way, you can see the distribution is, is still um, very clearly separate. Um, and that relationship being um, significantly different between the two regions is consistent, consistently the case across all material types um, that have a large enough sample size to measure. Um, so excluding wood chips in this case. But as you can see, some of those values um, go past this threshold that I've noted of 47.7 degrees Celsius or 118 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is the point at which I um, experience first degree burns. Um, so that's definitely a, a health impact there potentially. Um, so to wrap this up, um, this brings uh, back to questions of um, if there is there inevitable heat, um, because we know that these two regions are so significantly different in terms of uh, the demographics that are are living there and working there. Um, we know that the marginalized communities in South LA are more greatly affected by the, um, the higher temperatures in recreational spaces that they have access to. 
Um, speaking of access, um, as I mentioned earlier, the coolest space in South LA during that heat wave was a golf course. Um, and so that begs questions of what's public versus private and what do people have access to. Um, in terms of uh, vulnerable populations, heat stress is definitely something that can um, affect human health in, in a variety of ways, um, but it, it's uh, impacts are compounded if you're a person that's elderly, if you're young, if you have pre-existing conditions, if you work outside, all of those factors can compound um, to make those health impacts more severe. Um, and so uh, when it comes to those health impacts, there's also a question of who has access to health care to remediate those effects. Um, in terms of insurance, um, South LA, uh, the percentage of individuals that have access to insurance is, is significantly lower than in West LA. So um, all in all, um, it's some great differences there <laughs> um, in terms of uh, what these different communities are experiencing and what they have access to and places um, where they play, um, which is generally not what's considered when people talk about urban heat. Normally, it's just where do people live? Um, and so I was hoping to look into this kind of untapped area. Uh, I would like to thank my research mentors of uh, Dr. Josh Fisher, Dr. Jason Douglas, um, as well as Communities for a Better Environment, um, who uh, were involved in that community uh, little research, um, as well as um, another member of my research team, um, Nani, um, who uh, reviewed a lot of my, my work. Um, she was great, and fun night for NASA. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, that was amazing because you're amazing, so I'm not surprised. That was really, really good. Sorry. Um, so the thing that surprises me most about this is that it makes sense to me why one material would be hotter than another material, right? If I'm standing on concrete, I'm going to be warmer than if I'm standing on natural turf. I get that part. But if I understood your slides correctly, if I'm standing in natural turf in South LA, I'm hotter than if I'm standing on the same natural turf in West LA. And I'd love to hear you dive into what's the mechanism for that? Is that because any particular space is influenced by a larger space surrounding it, suggesting that we need like regional strategies and one part can't fix it? Or is there another mechanism that explains that difference by region? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Because um, something that I noticed as well is like, why are these same materials showing up differently in different areas? Um, and so, while I don't have a conclusive answer to that, um, I would say that um, there's definitely a, a lot of potential factors that could be influencing that. Um, one might be tree cover, for instance. Um, we can have the same grass, but uh, if there's a lot of shade that's produced, that's going to cause lower temperatures to be in one area than the other, um, as well as um, potentially even still with natural turf, um, what's the frequency of watering of that turf? Uh, if an area is getting like, more frequently Water then the vegetation can be healthier is going to be cooler, and the water itself is going to cool down the area as well. Um, but if there's not a lot of water going on, not a lot of maintenance, then it could just really go back to dirt. And so I don't have a way of differentiating that in terms of what uh, I'm defining as natural turf. I don't know if it's like the grass is doing great right now or not. Um, but those are two uh, potential factors that could have influenced that sort of result. Yes. Um, great presentation, Zoe. Um, so I'm thinking about how uh, heat waves are expected not only to increase in frequency, but duration, right? And so um, have you thought about how the impacts of urban heat island effect are impacted by the duration of how many days um, an area might experience that? Because it's all about heat retention and materials. And so what do you think was happening on that day? Yeah, so I um, can't say exactly because the number of heat waves that were actually captured that I was able to look at for, during the daytime um, was pretty limited, and this is my best data that I can pull from. Um, so the more kind of compare like past versus present, um, it's a little bit difficult, and also even stress when it goes back to 2018. So um, that has some limitations there, um, but I would expect that to have a significant or at least some impact um, in terms of what temperatures are being reached, if it's being retained 
throughout the day and then overnight and then it builds up um, continually. But um, in terms of some more concrete answer than that, I unfortunately don't have it. If you were to continue with this project, uh, what would you want to do? Great question. <laughs> um, so uh, hopefully I am continuing with this project. Um, but essentially, um, I have um, started to look at, like, since this is just a snapshot, started to look at kind of diurnal cycles and where does the um, key go and how is that significant difference between the two regions um, maintained um, throughout the day or throughout the night um, and in different ways. Um, the materials act differently, they pertain heat differently. Um, but also, um, a major uh, focus that was brought up during those community sessions was. Um, heat in schools, and that's something I started doing um, with this project and ended up kind of splitting it into two different uh, foci, just sticking with the recreational spaces for now, but um, I did some uh, preliminary data analysis for um, areas that are within 500 meters of public schools, so elementary, middle, and high um, within um, West LA, within actually the entire county, um, and uh, Southeast LA and South LA end up being really hot. Um, I just picked a, a hot a data from a hot day. The ambient temperatures at, at the time that I was doing the preliminary analysis was like 82 degrees. So like hot, but not like scorching. Um, and uh, if you remember that, um, I guess note of like the 118 degrees Fahrenheit um, for Southeast LA, about half of the, the area um, within 500 meters of schools in Southeast LA, we're above that threshold, um, which is pretty significant um, and definitely a cause for concern, particularly because those are also more vulnerable populations, um, given that their school children and they're younger and more affected by heat stress. So um, that's where I'll be going next with this. Um, Great. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I'll second Dr. Keller in that you are amazing. Uh, these are these are great results, great in-depth analysis, and cutting edge, um, and a great kind of senior you know student project. But has NASA taken notice? Has has they seen have they seen your results at all? Um, I don't I don't know that they've seen or eco stress. What I have done, I haven't sent anything off to anyone at EcoStress. Um, anyone with EcoStress right now, um, but. As of our last research meeting, um, Dr. Douglas was mentioning that um, he recently met with um, not sure what section of NASA, but um, they basically were expressing that they had a very high interest in the project. Um, and uh, I think uh, getting those results off would be great, but only had that meeting yesterday. So um, <laughs> basically, uh, to be determined, but I um, would love to share that for sure. So your uh, your heat map is that on the website, perhaps? It has, well, okay. One, <laughs> thank you, thank you for that prompting. Yes, one of, the, one of my maps is on the Ecosystems website, yeah, so um, and you can see it. Woo, woo. Yes, we're there. I had forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> All And then the the All right. My right. And you're being your And you're not. Okay. Slade. Hello, my name is Slade Lashevsky, and I'm going to present to you all on high spatial and temporal resolution census data revealing communities at risk along the wild and Base in California. So, what is the wildland urban interface? 
things. Um, the Wuli is a transitional zone that is ecologically sensitive to wildfires. So um, as we can see here in this uh, figure, um, there's interface communities at the top and comparing to like more dramatic urban and rural communities. Um, interface communities are mostly going to be um, high, high density housing that is right next to uh, vegetation, while intermixed communities are going to be um, more in rural areas where it's just housing here and there, which is directly intermingling with uh, vegetation. So just to give an example of these sort of communities and interface community would be something like Oakland, uh, California, where an intermixed community would probably be like Santa Monica Mountains, something like that. So those are just the two types of wild and urban interfaces. Um, so I'd also like to mention the human's impact on the Wuyi. So humans are the main reason for wildfires, specifically within the Western Wuyi. So 97% of wildfires have occurred because of human causes within the Wuyi, while the other 3% are things like lightning. And also, uh, most of the destruction of property happens within the Wuyi. So we see that 50% is happening in the interface and 32% is happening in the intermix and the rest is happening in rural and uh, non-rural, in non-rural, so like urban areas. Um, also, housing is the main driver for this expansion. So every 10 years, they update what the boundaries of the WUI are and um, currently, most of that change is happening because people are moving to uh, more vegetated areas. It is not necessarily um, happening because vegetation, new vegetation is being planted. So uh, populations, and as we were looking at, is very significant to figure out how people are being affected and how this is a, how we're affecting um, the wildland because uh, this that's the driver for that expansion. Um, and I'd also like to note um, that most destruction, uh, most wildfires start in private property. So what I've found from a study, someone else has done a study, um, and they found that in California specifically, most destructive wildfires, um, 63 most destructive wildfires, um, really destructive wildfires have uh, started on private property within the movie and expanded from there. So um, knowing how public lands have been used, um, been taken and turned into private property um, is pretty significant. So um, I'm going to address these three questions. How did populations change along California's Wui? Which communities slash counties were greatly affected by such change and what are the possible drivers for this change? So I just wanna go briefly over um, the methods that were used. So as I was saying, every 10 years, they make new boundaries for, for the WUI. Um, we use 2010 boundaries. Um, these are at the block level. So just to give an idea, the block level is a little bit larger than the census tract level. Um, we use census tract level data for the population count. Um, we weren't, at first we were gonna use block level, but we thought that since they were very closely related, using that higher resolution, spatial resolution, would be better for us to get um, an overall picture of what is occurring. Um, and also the explanatory value variables are also at the census tract level. So that's like percent houses owned, um, affordability, and the wildfire hazard potential. Um, and just to go briefly over the statistics, um, we use a man Kendall's test for monotonic trends. We tried doing the linear regression, um, but we found that uh, populations are moving to these areas in a linear fashion. It's happening more um, slow and then fast and slow again. So using a monotonic trend helps us capture um, the significance to this change. And also for those, um, for those explanatory variables, we used a Pearson and Spearman correlation. So that's a linear um, correlation and a monotonic correlation to sort of see the differences there. Um, so just to go over the results as well. So interface communities are rapidly changing in population comparatively to inter intermixed communities. So as you can see um, on the Y axis, the WUI type, so high density interface, that would be, like I said before, Oakland, and then 
the medium and low density, and then high density intermix, um, medium density and low density intermix. So as we can see here, um, these are only significantly changing um, census tracts. So they're only counting for that, just to give some idea of like, it's not every census tract that's being um, pictured here. Um, but we are seeing that the high density interface are having a significant <laughs> increase while it isn't really happening in all these other um, areas. Although it, there's still an increase, it's not as dramatic. Um, so geographic regions also vary in significance. So as we see, the South Coast region and Bay Area are having a dr more dramatic change when it comes to uh, population. This makes sense considering that these communities are going to be interface communities. As we saw before, interface communities are going to be that urban sprawl. It's not going to be people who want to move necessarily to more rural areas like in the central region or the northern region. And that's why we're not seeing um, that significant, that high growth tracks. Although I'm pretty much across all regions, you're still seeing growth. So that really tells you where people are moving. And to just get more specific into the Bay Area in Southern California, in the Bay Area, you're seeing a higher proportion of people moving to uh, wooey areas, while in Southern California, it's a higher population. So you know, people are in the Bay Area, you have things like Napa Valley, like there's going to be those interface communities. And uh, in Southern California, you have places like Orange. We know that Orange County in general has a lot of urban spaces. You're not seeing that sort of interface community because everywhere is just crowded by concrete. <laughs> So you're gonna, even though the higher there's a higher population, it's the proportion is not is not there. And just to give an idea of like what this is showing, um, the more darker green, it's a higher proportion, and the darker gray, gray or like the black, that's gonna be a higher population. So just so you can understand um, how that sort of is pictured on those figures. And just to get into more specifics as to what I was saying, we have the numbers right here. So as you can see, per, to get it into perspective, only 10% of California's um, spaces is uh, wooey. So it's pretty significant to see that in pretty much every county in the Bay Area, more than 15% of the population is living in these areas. And this is only in the WUI only captures 10% of land mass. So that's I'm, that's pretty significant at the end of the day. The only outlier is Riverside when it comes to uh, sort of what communities are mostly changing in population, but you're seeing similar trends um, throughout different counties in Bay Area and Southern California. Um, and just to get into the drivers, so um, looking at house affordability and house ownership, house ownership, we did find um, a moderate correlation with that. Uh, the, the Spearman value, uh, which is also moderate, and the, um, and the Pearson model, which is also moderate. Um, while with the wildfire hazard, interesting enough, people don't seem to be greatly affected by that. They don't seem to care um, much about that risk when it comes to choosing somewhere to live. Uh, in similar sort of thing, it's uh, green, darker green is the higher proportion and dark, darker black is a higher population. So just to get into discussion, um, we found that the population is increasing and there is a significant increase. Interface communities are particularly growing and that can be alarming considering most pop um, most damage to property is happening in these interface communities. So this is sort of a double, this is a double whammy. <laughs> um, we see that uh, there's more destruction in the WUI. There's especially more destruction in the interface communities. And these are the communities that are growing in population compared to the intermix. And um, it kind of shows you what uh, people take into account when they decide where they're going to uh, live. 
and also which communities and counties um, were greatly affected by such change. So we're seeing that the Bay Area and Southern California are having that significant change. It's, um, in my mind, it is looking at sort of people are wanting that private property. People are wanting that space to be able to live where they want to live. And they aren't interested in what could be the possible repercussions for that sort of private land that they have. Um, Northern region and central region are have less risk for property damage considering where that property damage is occurring and that's not where people are going. Urban sprawl is very prevalent today um, and it still is. That is not something that we should necessarily be prioritizing when it comes to <laughs> wildfires, wildfire risk. Um, so, and then lastly, just what are the possible drivers for this change? Um, house affordability, house ownership. I I sound like a broken record, record at this point, but you know, it's, I mean, we want to add more independent variables at the end of the day to sort of get more significance in our results. Um, right now, we're looking at correlations um, and we want to get more answers on what could be causing this because when it comes to correlation, we can't make that um, official uh, sort of saying like this is what the reason is that this is occurring. Um, but I mean, it is beginning this preliminary analysis is really getting at what is the drivers of this change. And also, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Shenwei Jia, who has helped greatly with this research, Jess Feiner and Wes, who were also um, with me in the GCI uh, project, and ECHO has been very helpful in helping me move forward with this process and supporting me throughout these last few years. Uh, I'm going to ask one just so I can say the word wooey. Um, <laughs> so that was also amazing study, really, really, really well done. So you're looking at, if I understood this right, sort of wildfire risk as one of the possible predictive barriers. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about how wildfire risk is calculated? Is that kind of a long-term average for risk? So... I wish I had the answers on that. Um, we mostly, we didn't like <coughs> specifically into what that risk was calculated as just because um, we found it as not being a predictor yeah. for this um, change. Uh, Dr. Chen Weijia, she helped a lot with finding these uh, sort of um, explanatory variables. Um, yeah, honestly, I that would definitely be something I would want to look more into uh, just because it does have a lot to say about what people uh, do and what people like take into consideration. But it also, it also like just to give an idea of like what is considered usually with wildfire potential is um, sort of fuels and stuff like that. So how much um, fuel management and how many, um, how much like sort of like debris you're seeing on the ground uh, when it comes, and also temperatures obviously as well. So those are uh, two things that are usually taken into account um, when it comes to wildfire risk. What, what are the next steps for you now? So uh, yes, so we're gonna look at more independent variables just to sort of get a better uh, look at what could be causing these drivers. Because at first we were mainly looking at what the population trends were because we knew that the Wuli was a particularly vulnerable, vulnerable area for wildfires. So having that in mind, just knowing who was gonna be there um, gives you some in insight into what should be done when it comes to policy. But, um, we started asking ourselves questions, why is this change happening? So it was sort of like the next step that occurred. And then after that, now we want to add more independent variables. We want to do different analyses. We want to make sure that instead of getting a correlation, we're getting more of that 
sort of solid analysis, that strong analysis. So this is, will be something that um, will be expanded upon in the next few months. Oh, so you're working on it over the summer? Yes, yes. yes. And my good friend Josh Fisher is trying to set both of you up to talk about how awesome you are. Where will you be doing this work starting on August 14th, Slade? Like? Uh, at Miami University with Dr. Ja. As a? As a, a assist. I'll be doing assistant. Wow, a grad student, but continuing yeah. this work. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'll be good. <laughs> So you're going to continue this in, in Miami then? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think works. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll be continuing more work there. I think we're gonna tr we're gonna um, we're working on getting this published over the summer. We were gonna be submitting it to um, the conference that we went to. They had proceedings to submit it, but they wanted to look at more high impact journals to like publish there. So um, they they were like, we have some more time, so we'll expand upon it some more and then publish it then, so. Yeah, there's a, a lot of interest and money in wildfire right now. I, yeah. I mean, I'm seeing it from the federal level. There's just a flood of money and the commercial level, just everybody wants any of this work it, done on wildfire and there's just, there's just not enough people. So I definitely support and encourage you to continue this type of work because there is a immediate future. When I was, at the conference that I um, did my poster presentation at, there was a lot of people who, um, it was a, almost a conflict because there'd be private organizations that were there and then public. And a lot of the private people would be like, oh, this is really helpful for blah, 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 blah. But like, it's not allowed to be given to all of you. So people would be asking questions like, oh, like if this is so important, like, why isn't it like accessible to more people? So it's definitely an interesting field where like a lot of that work does need to be like looked at by a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Troy. Take a few minutes before we go to the next so let me <laughs> sounds like the risk manager or the fire risk. Mm -hmm. kind of yeah, it's like yeah. It's like it's like uphill, like, like, yeah. Is there any value in looking at like people make four terms but if you think just have a nozzle last year? They build off the kind of time. Do they come around? So even that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So no. You, they'll you just build. So, yeah. so like, if it's to be short term, long term. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. That's one of those things. So, like, people don't. Don't. Yeah. It's like. It's like Yes, and a lot of like companies are buying like a lot of people who are doing this research are selling the research privately to interested developers getting access to this public. So like a lot of our risk assessments are being done, so we're going out and it's just not accessible. But there are, but there's no reason to focus a little more on the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Their like insurance will be going up and then my book. That's really yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, no, really. Just like, 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 like, it added another layer. But you use them well. You know, like anybody can have them. He gives me credit. Don't worry. It's not a 
Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Okay, so where's my presentation? Now we're on to all my students, I guess. We're going to hear from Max. Uh, so I did my project on the effects of the Phagmites australis and its invasion on the California deltas, and I wanted to look into the effects on food resources for juvenile fish. So a little background, uh, we did a research project on the Sassoon Marsh. Um, it's located in the Bay Area Delta, and these wetland ecosystems are very vulnerable to plant invasion, um, especially the Phagmites australis, which is an invasive species here. Um, it's a common reed that grows up to like 15 feet tall and kind of forms just like aggressive monoculture and just applicates all the native species. Um, as you can see that like since 1999 to 2015, the presence of the phagmites has gone up 325%. So it's definitely taken over and there's been a lot of research that shows that it's been reducing a lot of biodiversity there. Um, and because of this, um, there have been various efforts to control and like eradicate all the phagmites, but they've been very costly and honestly quite unsuccessful. So I kind of wanted to like look back out into the subject and see if there's possibly some ecosystem services that we were just ignoring or overlooking that the phagmites might provide. So this gets into my question, does the phagmites australis have any positive impacts in the Sassoon Marsh? Um, I was focusing specifically on Phragmites effects on fish food resources. So first, um, some background for environmental data we found. Um, so it's, this is Celsius on the y-axis, and we can see that underneath the Phragmites canopies, um, the temperatures are not only lower, but less variable. So I thought this might have some sort of impact on the ecosystem and might have some sort of impact on the invertebrates underneath there. Um, maybe making them larger or more nutrient dense for various reasons. So I also focused on the Chinook salmon. Um, the Chinook salmon is a key sense species there. Uh, they're very important for the ecosystem and culturally, uh, economically, they're all like very important for this region. Um, and they're also closely related with the plant canopies on the channel's edge. Um, the juvenile fish there, uh, when they spawn, they feed on the invertebrates underneath these canopies, um, mostly because they're just trying to stay away from predation, but also, of course, because they need to eat. Um, so I thought it was important to look at the juveniles and phragmites relationship. And also, given the importance of the phragmites, or not the phragmites, given the importance of the Chinook salmon um, in this ecosystem, there's been a lot of policy, especially water policy, that's all focused around the fish. So I thought if I wanted to influence policy in some sort of way, I have to see how does the phragmites affect the fish. So um, this kind of brought us all around to my hypothesis. And I wanted to look at amphipods specifically because that's the main food source for the Chinook salmon. And my hypothesis was that the total biomass of amphipods underneath the phragmites canopies was actually going to be greater than that underneath the native canopies because the from the temperature graph before, the Phragmites canopies could act as almost like a climate refuge, um, and like a safe haven for these invertebrates and help, help them deal with more extreme temperatures and reduce heat stress. So for methods, um, I did not do this, but um, the field study was we collected um, transect data, we collected samples of invertebrates and really just like mud and everything in four different transects, zero meters, five meters, 10 meters, and 20 meters um, from the channel's edge. Um, and then from that, we did some microscopy work to identify all the different invertebrates. And then since I was focusing solely on the amphipods, because that's the important food source for the Chinook salmon, um, I looked at the amphipods and then collected the body length, uh, the body length, and then multiplied that by an allometric coefficient, which is kind of like a weight to length ratio or equation. And from that, I was able to calculate the total biomass of the amphipods. Um, and then I also only looked at the month of March because that was the start of the spawning season for the Chinook salmon. So I figured when the juveniles are kind of getting introduced into this ecosystem, like 
are the amphipods abundant and large at the time. So for the results, this first graph shows the average amphipod biomass um, by the transects and by the vegetation type. Um, so for what was this statistically significant, we found that there was a difference in average amphipod biomass between the 20 meter mark and the zero, five, and 10 meter. However, this was not statistically different between vegetation type. So there was no difference in average amphipod biomass between vegetation type. Only transect, which in terms of the vegetation, like doesn't really matter. Um, slightly different, but very similar graph. So this is the total amphipod biomass underneath the Phragmites and the native, regardless of transect, uh, just like in the vegetation type. Um, there was still no statistically significant difference between the total amphipod biomass. Um, but there is somewhat of a trend, as you can see. Um, and I think I also only looked at the month of March, but the whole season is uh, March through June, like the whole spawning season is March through June. So if we had more data, um, then that could probably strengthen this relationship. But still, regardless, um, there's no significant difference between the total amphipod biomass. So this comes into our conclusion, which is basically that there's no difference between the Phragmites and the native canopies. And therefore, as far as fish food resources go, there's no difference in ecosystem services between the native and the Phragmites. So the Phragmites isn't having a negative impact on the ecosystem as far as fish food resources go. Um, and then for this also relates closely with another study that we did in the lab, which was um, we wanted to look at the protein concentration, the nutrient concentrations of the amphipods. So basically what we did is we took amphipods from the native canopies and from the Phragmites canopies, and then we raised them in the lab. And you can see even from week zero, the Phragmites is the blue, the native is the red, but um, we can see by week zero, there's still a difference in total protein concentration between the Phragmites and the native. Um, and these are the amphipods. And this, trend kind of increases over time. By week six, you can see there's an extreme difference in total protein concentration between the amphipods in the, um, in the Phragmites canopies and the amphipods in the native canopies. So I kind of like relate this to, like if juvenile and salmon are like looking for food and they're looking for amphipods, if they find amphipods that are from underneath the Phragmites canopy, then it's almost like they're eating like organic or like a higher quality food as it's like non-organic. So even though the total biomass might not be statistically different between the uh, Phragmites and the native canopies, uh, because these protein concentrations, because the food quality, the body quality of the amphipods in the Phragmites is so much better, um, there's kind of the argument to say that there's a better, uh, there's an ecosystem service that the Phragmites um, gives to the Susu Marsh. Um, and then, as far as broader implications, uh, so as I said earlier, a lot of, we spend like millions of dollars each year trying to just clear cut all the Phragmites, get rid of it, and it doesn't really work super well. Um, I think this kind of, I wanted to like really rethink our management strategies. We've even seen that like, instead of clear cutting everything, if we take like a more sectional approach and just like cut out a lot, like a swap of the Phragmites, and then reintroduce the native canopy. The native canopy can compete. Um, so maybe if we take a strategy like this, we can get the benefits of the Phragmites and the benefits of the native canopy and bring back that biodiversity. Um, and I think just like overall, it's important, like in terms of invasive species go, there's a lot of really bad connotations with like invasive species. Like they have to be bad for the ecosystem. Uh, they don't belong there, but we should look at just the positive and negative impacts that it might have um, on the ecosystem. And this being said, like, I'm not get, negating any of the negative impacts. I know it decreases some biodiversity in the area, um, but I think there's just a lot more nuanced relationship between the invasive species um, of the Phragmites in, uh, in the California deltas and climate change. Um, for example, like my project, we saw that the temperature was lower underneath the Phragmites. And with climate change, with rising average temperatures, Possibly the Phragmites could help uh, a lot of these invertebrate species deal with these changing climates. 
And also, as you'll see from other projects in the future, like Megan's going to talk about, um, birds utilize the Phragmites like a bunch of different species. So I think it's important to look at maybe the different things where the Phragmites, even though it's an invasive species, how could it possibly help this ecosystem? Um, so as far as acknowledgments go, Dr. Tanner, uh, amazing advisor, so helpful. Uh, Susie was amazing. Everyone else in the lab helped me go through all the super tedious microscopy work and analysis of everything. But and shout out to the Seeker Lab. And yeah, that's it. Out of all the fish out in the marsh, why did you make salmon? So there's two very, it's, it's funny, like Dr. Tanner's kind of like venting to me about this, <laughs> about how like she's really frustrated that like all, like there's like the Delta smell, which is like super important species um, in the California Deltas. And basically all of our policy is focused around like helping these fish populations. So it's like, so if I'm hoping to impact um, like policy or management policies, you have to look at it from the framework of how does it impact these fish? So the two fish that are important there are the delta smell, especially, and the Chinook salmon. The delta smell is basically extinct, so I'm like, that's just not helpful to anyone. So I was the Chinook salmon. Excellent answer. I was kind of curious, um, when you mentioned, like, proteins, um, although, like, fish are very mobile, so it probably, probably, I don't know if you can necessarily look at it, but, like, looking at the different canopies, like, is there potential like differences in um, those? Are do you think that there could be potential differences in those fish in like their body measurements and such? Like because they're getting maybe more nutrients. This is might be outside the realm. Of what do you love that? I mean, so the study with the protein concentration was the amphipods, okay. but hopefully, like if the fish are underneath the phragmites yeah. and therefore eating the phragmites amphipods, yeah, they could. Be healthier because they're getting better like nutrient quality like even though like the same biomass like the same size amphipods will be like a higher nutrient quality with the primary ones so yeah something well, why why is the temperature cooler under phragmites um most likely because the phragmites is just huge like they can grow up to like 15 feet tall and they make these super dense like monocultures uh which is part of the reason why they're like Bad for the ecosystem, but also that's what I'm saying that like with the temperature data, um, because they form these like such dense, tall, um, like monocultures, that could possibly be helpful for the ecosystem. Is it? But your results show they're not actually bigger, or there's not more biomass. Uh, there's not more biomass in terms of amphipods. Um, yeah, this is. I was comparing the amphipod biomass, uh, not the actual plant biomass. So the plant biomass is bigger than the native. Uh, yeah. This is a spherical cow question. <laughs> so you have some cool unit conversions that you could play with here, right? So you have amphipod biomass per unit area, and then you essentially have protein concentration within amphipods. Your units don't quite work out because you've got it as like microliters per or okay. megagrams per microliter or whatever. But, you know, fish don't really care about how much biomass they eat. They care about how much protein they eat. Have you played around with the unit conversion at all? And it, it, are there ways that you could express amphipod protein content per meter squared in the different plant communities to show what the fish are actually thinking about? Um, I probably could. The interesting thing is, while we did do our study in, like, transects, which was, like, it was a quarter meter by a quarter meter or something, um, so that would be, like, like area measurement. I didn't really use that because they're all like, since they're all done that way, I thought the actual area wasn't important. Therefore, I didn't use it in my units um, and just compared like the total species found and the total biomass found in those areas. But yes, you could um, hypothetically multiply it by like the biomass times the concentration and then do it per unit area. Right. And both of those things trend towards being higher in the Phragmites, right? And so if you multiply those two things, you're going to pull that difference out mm -hmm. even further with probably a more relevant ecological indicator. Yeah, nice job. That was really well done. 
I guess follow that to the bigger biomass. Is is the phragmites since they're bigger and cooler? Are, are they choking the waterways because they're kind of taking over a lot? Um, yes, but they do. Like I can show you. I like to point it out, but up here you can see the phragmites is the one on the other side, and the native is the one on this side. Um, and like they still like stick to their edge of the marsh, but I think there are, there have been some issues with like Marty's um, choking some of the waterways. However, I don't want to make any like definitive claims about that because I didn't do my research specifically about like, all the different negative impacts of like Marty's. I was looking more at like the invert effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I told you this. I told you this. I He's always fancy. So, 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 you want to go sailing fishing? Bigger sailing. Real estate companies. But you like, well, like, yeah, it's it's more it's more it's more like, yeah, like, nice. Yeah. yeah. But it's, no, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's nice. I mean, if like, you can get outside of skate, it's not a lot of money. It's it's always, I mean, it's a, it's like, any sport. Yeah. Great. It's a huge engine. Yeah. As you age out, you got to figure out how to do that. Yeah, like a lot of the skate film, we do like side jobs or all the stuff. What? Side jobs. 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 Side also, just like yeah, on a super <laughs> yeah. first thing I'm gonna tell people. <laughs> I noticed that. Like, hey, minutes spare, 30 minutes. It's the largest contingent in I know, right? So now I'm like, forget that. It says contingent on the Susan. Soon. <laughs> yeah, one of the one of the things you know how I do like all this stuff. Like one of the things on my abstract is the largest one. Because a lot of them come in and go. Yeah. Have your abstract. I wouldn't be surprised. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Because second the And then there's like, uh, you never know. No, there's definitely yeah. like, is it the largest on the list? It's actually made that. How is it? Why? But I thought it's important. Because I just, 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 Alaska. Oh, Alaska doesn't have actually like coastal. I'm going to take a lot of space. I am going to point out. Well, there's a debate among you. Keep it in some areas. You want to sell that. Yeah. What is it? It's all titles? Nothing. No, no. That's what, yeah, that's that's just my presentation. Well, listen, at this point, <laughs> the gun. The facts seem to be questionable. There's already polls. There's already <laughs> It's just the abstract. So it's a non title brandish. I mean, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. That's why I was so old. I'm not getting the first time here. Listen, I need to be able to for this presentation. All right, I'll stop asking questions. Yeah. Don't wait. Exactly.
Okay, we're going to get started with our last two. Um, more about the thread way so you can drill another student about that. Um, so ready for that spherical cap. Yeah, let's yeah. hear it, Megan. <laughs> Hi, you guys. My name is Megan, and I'll be telling you about birth occupancy and restored tidal wetlands. And just to let everyone know, the abstract does have a typo. It's not the largest <laughs> wetland in the United States. It's the largest continuous brackish wetland. Two key important words there. Just to let you know, nobody blames me at the end of this. Okay, so a little bit of background on, on where this study was located. It's located in the Sassoon Marsh, as Max was saying, and it's about 470 kilometers squared. And it is Upstream of it is the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, and downstream of it is San Francisco Bay, just to get a little geographical location. As you can also see in that really tiny little red box, it is where it's located. And it's also a land, a land ownership mosaic, and it's both public and privately owned. And the public is the California Fish and Wildlife and the Department of Water Resources, which is in the, the pink. And hey, you guys, welcome. <laughs> And um, the private is about the 158 duck hunting clubs that have been there for over 100 years, and that's in the green. And as you can see, there's significantly more private land than public land. And this is super interesting because it does create a lot of management, kind of like debate going on and what to do for the march. But I will explain that in a couple of slides. And as time goes on, um, Historically, the Sassoon Marsh has actually been managed for managed wetlands and specifically ducks, but in recent years, they're starting to go towards more tidal restoration projects. And I'll explain that. So managed versus tidal wetlands, what is it? So managed wetlands use levees and dikes to artificially control the flow of water and is primarily used for habitat and food optimization for dabbling ducks, like the really cute northern pintail that you see up there. While tidal wetlands are open water subject to tidal action and it floods and drains with the tide. And why they're doing this, why they're re-implementing it is to restore certain ecosystem services. And it's super important for endangered species out there like the salt marsh harvest mouse and the delta smelt that Max mentioned earlier. And just to re-clarify that the Susun Marsh has historically prioritized habitat spaces for ducks. So this kind of leads into my question of how do birds occupy habitats within restored tidal wetland? Because as we continue to go from managed to tidal spaces, how do birds interact with that space in both pre-restoration and post-restoration sites? So before I get into it, I want to start by saying the first, the four habitat types that I will be mentioning in my presentation are marsh ponds. And you can see a really cute swan up there if you squint your eyes really, really hard. We have the deep channels and the shallow channels and the marsh plain, which actually some of the research was in Dr. Kenner up there. So beautifully taking research. So for the methods, we have three different sites that we focused on within this and Black, Black Lock, Hill Slope, and Tule Red, all within different stages of pre versus post restoration. Black Lock was breached over a decade, so it's about 10 years post restoration. Hill Slope at the time of this study was pre restoration, so it's still managed. But now, in like the past year, it's now a post-restoration tidal wetland. And Tule Red was the first ever um, tidal restoration project within the marsh. Super interesting, super fun stuff. So we did two different types of surveys to get this data. We did an oral survey between November of 2020 and 2021. And we set up six semi-permanent 50-meter transects along the back marsh, marsh on the edges of the channel <laughs> perpendicular to the marsh plain. And two researchers went out and started walking along the transect at every 10 meters, they were like along the transect tape and were listening. Aural just means that you're listening and you're hearing and observing. So super, super cool stuff. And Hillsdale was similar to Tule Red, but Black Lock slightly different because it is a marsh plain, marsh plain mosaic. There was increased flooding in the area, so it changed the data just a little bit. And then the camera trap surveys we did for a three month period between March and May of 2021. And this is specifically in the Tule Red site. Five permanent cameras were installed in tributary channels, marsh plains, and marsh ponds to get the diverse habitat types that we were looking for. And, and pictures were captured hourly between sunrise and sunset. So a lot of data. 
So for the results, this is a really, a really amazing graph that you can't find anywhere else that was done by one of the researchers, but this shows specifically only tool we read. And um, that both camera and oral data is presented. The oral sites were in green and the camera sites were in purple. And if you look, it shows all the different habitat types that we found within the space. So deep channel, shallow channel, and the marsh ponds, as I mentioned earlier. And we found the most prevalent bird within each site and use the Shannon Wiener Diversity Index, which calculates species richness and species abundance to take the total estimated diversity within a community. And we found um, that mute swans are most prevalent within marsh ponds. Um, mallards are most prevalent basically everywhere else, <laughs> except for um, the red-winged blackbirds and the deep channel. And so the next graph that I have for you guys shows the relationship between bird abundance and invasive versus native and short versus tall vegetation. And what's super interesting about this is that species abundance is actually higher in Phragmites, as you can see by significantly higher, but we have more species richness in the native canopies, which with 16 taxa. And so I wanted to understand the relationship between the marsh wren, which is that blue, that teal color that you see, and um, understand the relationship between vegetation height and abundance. And uh, to do this, I calculated a linear mixed effect model, which takes, it's a multivariable linear regression to get the significance in relationship between two or more variables. And I got the, a p-value of less than 0 0.05, which means that there is a significant relationship. And I also did that with the song sparrow, which is like the purple leaf sort of color that you're seeing, but I found no significant relationship. And then for my last graph, this shows bird abundance in relationship to pre versus post restoration sites within the space. And abundance is actually highest in the Tully Red Marsh Plain, about less than a year post restoration. And a couple of the different things that I noticed on this graph is that pre restoration marsh plain has the lowest abundance. And there's a massive difference between one year post restoration and 10 years post restoration, which brings up an interesting question that I'll bring up in my broader implications. And then also the marsh plain has higher abundance than in tidal areas. So for my overall results of how birds actually utilize the space. So we found that songbirds utilize tall, dense vegetation, smaller waterfowl utilize deep and shallow channels, and larger waterfowl utilize marsh ponds. And bonus points if any of you guys can identify what each of these species are. If not, I'll just, I can just tell you. <laughs> and so for broader implications, um, this data is super, super important because there are a lot of conversations that are happening right now regarding the management of the marsh. And we are slowly moving our way towards restoring tidal activity into most of the marsh just to help the endangered species. But as this happens, ducks are more prioritized for managed wetlands. So it's kind of like a weird dilemma of like, how do we prioritize and how do we kind of use these spaces to best represent like birds as a whole? So it's important for the distribution of habitat types must be prioritized in future tidal restoration projects. And we have to understand how prioritization and management strategies have impacted habitat use in endemic, migratory, and invasive species. And that marsh ponds actually support non-native species because the mute swan that we saw a couple of slides back, let's see here, is actually um, an invasive species, but it has significantly um, like high amount of sightings at 358. So pretty gnarly stuff. They also have no natural predators. They're just massive. Like, you don't want to mess with one. I wouldn't. And then, so moving forward, um, if I were to continue this with this data, I would want to conduct studies on target species like the marsh wren because it's the most abundant songbird that we're going to find out in the marsh, but there's such little data on it. I found maybe two data sets on it, and one of them is in North Dakota. Not very helpful. And the and, um, second one would be um, understanding the relationship more about like song sparrows and then understanding how like migratory birds use the space as well. And so my two biggest questions that I took away from this is how does post ecological succession impact bird occupancy and how does bird occupancy change seasonally because it is also an important stop for the Great Pacific Flyway, which extends from the northern tip of Alaska all the way down to the south of Mexico, so the entire western coast basically. And this is a really important stop for the birds that use it for both wintering and breeding purposes. So just understanding like how does that change like over winters, fall, spring, and summer, and just understanding that. But I think, and then lastly, I want to acknowledge the wonderful PI that I have. Her name is Dr. Tanner, and then also the amazing people at UC Davis who actually went out and conducted this research, and um, the members of the Sassoon Resource Conservation District who are letting me 
write about this, speak about this at every conference, and hopefully publish a paper in the next couple months. And I think that's all. Don't be shy, guys. <laughs> oh, sure. I'll... Um... Yeah, I'm not even going to pretend it's a, a spherical cow question. I was going to make up a bird residence time question to put you on the spot, but I won't. I would have um, blocked so, <laughs> uh, Okay, so you had, and I, I don't remember your site's names, I apologize. You had a, a, a recently breached site yeah. that had brought back title restoration relatively recently. And then you had a site that had brought title restoration back decades ago, I'm guessing? Yeah, so a lot years ago. Black Lag was restored over, it was breached over a decade, which I don't, I would like to like look more into, but I like, it was an accident. Oh, it was an accidental yeah, breach. And okay. Then, yeah. So yeah, it was breached over a decade. So this represents like 10 years post-restoration and Truly Red was the first purposeful post-restoration, like title uh, reintroduction site. Okay. So Truly Red is recently restored and then you've got the Marsh Plain and black rock that's older you've got bird abundance that looks like it shoots up recently following restoration mm -hmm. and then comes back down following a decade yeah. of something yeah it, do you have any ideas on what that something is like what's um, that what causes that peak um or what might cause that peak it's probably more so from what i've seen honestly this actually like comes into one of my like moving forward questions is how does post ecological succession impact bird occupancy because when I was doing this research I did actually like notice the significant decline between that nine or so year period that we have within the sites and if I could look more into it I'd want to understand like because like they breached the levees they released it and they restore that tidal activity but like what else are they doing like after that at least like to the extent of knowledge that I have like I'm not really sure what they're doing after they like reintroduce that tidal activity like is there something that we're missing when it comes to conservation projects or is there more that we could be doing or like just like i feel like there's like some key points that like i'm missing between those nine years that would help explain this but if i were to move forward with this research like it'd be really interesting to study the differences in blackhawk versus like truly red because we do have that data it's just like me wanting to man up and actually like sift through like understand the differences between blackhawk and truly red does the vegetation change in any way following um, 10 years? I mean, what does Phragmites do if you reintroduce tidal dynamics? Um, I am not confident enough to answer that question, but we can always chat more about it yeah. <laughs> later. Good job. Um, but, really? Uh, that was actually really well done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I <laughs> didn't know how to answer your question. So um, I haven't looked at it, honestly, um, understanding the uh, relationship between tidal activity and Phragmites australis, but Phragmites is super, super abundant. It's, it, it disperses its seed through the wind, so it's a pretty hardy species. So I don't think, from my like personal like experience like learning about it, I really don't think it would be affected that much just because like it's everywhere. It's aggressive and as we saw through Max's presentation, like there's just there's so much that goes into it. That was amazing. Very well. Done. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? So what like what is it specifically about the restoration that leads to the bird abundance? Is it like the distribution of plants? Is it the volume of water? Like um, what is it specifically? So like just based on what I've seen and like um, all the different things, the biggest correlation to understanding bird occupancy is actually just habitat type because like larger waterfowl, like like the swans and the egrets and the herons do prefer like the, that those larger spaces to be able to like graze and forage for all like the fish and insects and everything that they find out there. Well, like songbirds and red-winged blackbirds, like all those things that we would find out there utilize those like really dense like vegetation for like their trees and their nesting and all those things. And I think it just really like, like the deep channels with the, um, the high vegetation like have those uh, resources for the songbirds, the way that those large like ponds have for like those larger species. So like larger species, larger spaces, smaller species, smaller spaces. <laughs> it's kind of just what I gathered from this. <laughs> And then follow up on Dr. Keller's question. So like it starts with a, a, a spike and it comes down, but like, is there a, a predator interaction here? Like do predators come in like, um, after they're like, oh, look at all this like meat, like let's go after it. And then like, like I, I, I'm, I'm not in, like a restoration ecologist. I'm just no, that's totally fair. Um, 
when I was doing this research, we also did include like birds of prey and understanding like how they utilize the space and like what they do. But honestly, like from what I've seen, um, this bird species code is a little complicated, but um, the NOHA is actually the Northern, Northern Harrier. And that's really the only bird of prey that like I really found in this research. And like, I don't know, there's just not, like not that I really know of like predators, like large waterfowl, feed on fish and insects and shorebirds feed on insects. And so it was like, I didn't really like seeing like coyotes or You're like domestic cats coming in. Not that I know of. I think that when I was going through this research, actually, I think I did see like some like ominous sort of like creature, but I just didn't question it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a beaver. It was a beaver, there we go. It looked ominous. <clears throat> Beavers aren't scary. Okay, um, I was just kind of curious, like the aural um, observations, yeah. are those like more like, oh, I hear something and I check if so, you heard it or do you, or do they know like specifically like what each bird sounds like? So um, the two researchers, I did all the data analy analyzing and everything. I took over this research from the, um, from the, the team at UC Davis. But from my knowledge of what I know about what they did is they went out there and like every like 10 transects along like the transect yeah. tape, they like listened. And once they like were able to identify that call, they then wrote down like the meter, like the meter number where they were at, um, the transect that they were at, um, tall versus short, native versus invasive vegetation, yeah. like the quantity of them. But I think that they were trained to like be able yeah. to like hear certain bird calls. I would love to be at that level one day, but I'm absolutely just not. Um, so I think that's what they did, I think. They just were trained in understanding. But uh, Dr. Kenner probably knows more, more than I do about that. But yeah, of course. You've never been to this marsh, so yeah, never some fun questions about context. <laughs> okay, we've got a couple minutes before our very last one. <laughs> New bottles of water, looks like we would want to go after. Yeah. We need one way to put them out. How's everyone's morning going? More of an afternoon at this point, but <laughs> thanks for hanging in. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best unique one. Did you do it? Did you do it? Did you do it? Yeah. She did. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's yeah, she was there. Yeah. I was there. <laughs> I was there. No, all about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's, that's a trip back. 
the characters. Is it recorded? Can you record the presentation? Are you going <coughs> to? Is it recording? Yes. Yeah. No, the. Wait, what? You have a question. Is it chat? There's a private message. I don't have anything. Oh. Can you stop? Yes, it's being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's being recorded. Okay, 12.30, the so last presentation of the day, and it's Woo. our only, like, non-natural non science talk of the entire <laughs> the whole conference, so let's hear it, Allison. <laughs> well, on that note, hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about extreme weather event metaphors, and to start out, how many of you have faced denial or confusion when trying to communicate about something related to science or climate change? <laughs> wow, overwhelming. <laughs> this reflects a common phenomena in the US that's known as the climate literacy crisis, where political controversy encourages denial and the general knowledge gap surrounding science and climate change. And this impacts society in a multitude of ways, but most specifically for this research through science communication as well as policy, behavior, and mitigation efforts. That classic tweet up there. <laughs> anyway, to address this knowledge gap and general misunderstanding, scientists, environmental scientists, environmental psychologists, social scientists alike, all focus on the science of message framing, which essentially is using research to determine the best way to communicate, educate, and change your audience's behavior. And two key pillars for message framing include hope-based messaging, the idea of Kind of self-explanatory but just say positive so your audience doesn't get deterred or freaked out or uninspired and the idea of explanatory metaphor so using a metaphor to connect something explain something and essentially creating possible positive simple relatable connections for your audience and as you've all experienced and environmental psychology has constantly verified fear and fact aren't quite enough to convince a public audience to change their mind or learn more about a topic that they aren't initially interested in. So for our research, we chose to utilize these message framing techniques to explain extreme weather from global warming and specifically how climate change and warming changes patterns and weather, making them more extreme and more unpredictable as this graph shows. That for the sake of focus, because there are so many climate change impacts on weather, we chose to focus in on communicating how to educate about flooding, wildfires, sea level rise, storms, heat waves, hurricanes and unpredictable weather and you'll hear me reference these later as our weather events our main seven of focus um, to create these metaphors we started with our issue and identified a cultural value that was kind of universal everyone wants to protect themselves it's instinctual instinctual and climate change makes hurricanes more dangerous causing danger so at the root of that we then progressed on to what was the causation behind the science of why hurricanes are more difficult or more dangerous and more unpredictable with climate change. So, for example, rampant CO2 makes hurricanes more dangerous. And similarly, everyone's experience adding fuel to a fire makes it more dangerous. Then from there, it was explicitly connecting these two events with an explanatory metaphor, such as rampant CO2 from human emissions adds fuel to the fire for stronger, more frequent, and less predictable hurricanes. And in line with hope-based messaging and message framing, we're always sure to embed or suggest a positive solution. So in that, lowering our emissions reduces danger. And as the audience reads these metaphors or learns these metaphors, taught these metaphors, they're also gonna follow this understanding chain where they're resonating with a cultural value, hearing this phenomena that they've experienced before, connecting it to a scientific experience and seeing where their solution And from here, after we did this for a painful amount of brainstorming options for all seven of our weather metaphors, we went in and spent about a year editing, rewriting, consulting with experts in linguistics, communication, science in general from the University of Florida and the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change, NOKI. From there, 
using our top ranking metaphors, we were able to draft and distribute a national online metaphor survey through Qualtrics, where we asked respondents to rank the three to five metaphors listed in front of them for each weather topic by their ability to explain it to you. And of course, all of these metaphors implied, not all, most of these metaphors implied message framing techniques and hope-based messaging, but in order to test their efficiency truly, we added in negative controls that were <coughs> violating the principles intentionally, making them over technical or scary, not encouraging efficacy. And additionally, we controlled for um, respondents' bias and fatigue by randomizing order. Um, additionally, on top of that, we accounted for demographic differences of gender, race, religion, generation, and zip code, but I'll touch more on this later. It pertains to some secondary hypotheses. And for results so far, we have almost 300 responses nationally as of this presentation. And our research still is ongoing. The survey is still out there. We're still doing advertisements. And as I'll touch on, we're still about to begin follow-up interviews for 50 over the phone. And we're sure to target new diversity through each of our ads to account for these demographic differences and just encourage more responses in general. Okay, so here's an example of what a participant that's taking our survey gets to see. And this is the wildfires metaphors that they're asked to rank, as I said, from best to worst according to their ability to explain to you. And the top rated metaphor from these four was number one, which reads, when hot weather persists for a long time, the land and the plants that live on this land dry out, becoming like unlit matches waiting to be ignited. It only takes one spark to ignite to light an entire box of matches, just like it only takes one spark to ignite acres of shrubs. And after we collected these 300 responses, we analyzed our data on R. Um, we created this figure for our demographic differences that's still in the editing phase, <laughs> but we also collected enough quantita qualitative data to make many metaphor tables as well, which was the main focus of our research. But unfortunately, this is our only numeric slash graphy figure, <laughs> technical term. Um, thus far, it's important to note that we've only completed descriptive statistics, so no inferences can be made about the general population quite yet, um, but this is what we've experienced. So now for our metaphor tables, this was our top metaphor overall table where you see the top ranking metaphors for each of the topics and the percentage that chose them as their number one metaphor along with where they fell in average ranking amongst everyone in the survey. And uh, this research was designed in collaboration with the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change, as I mentioned earlier. And it was designed so that their educators at their over 500 affiliated zoos, aquariums, national parks, and museums across the country can distribute information to the public and educate as best as possible. So, contrastingly, here are our lowest ranking ranking metaphors overall from our survey where unanimously they all aligned with our negative controls that as I mentioned earlier we threw in these controls one for each metaphor that was negative that was violating message framing that was intentionally scary intentionally over technical and with a hundred percent agreements for all seven topics they were the least liked. <laughs> this really shows the importance of message framing oh on. Our secondary hypothesis that I mentioned earlier that we accounted for religious beliefs among each participants, we asked for their like upbringing religion and what current practicing religion they are. And we wanted to consider, do religious beliefs affect metaphor preferences? And our results found that unsurprisingly, <laughs> they did in fact differ for their top preferences in five out of seven of the metaphors where most of them were one of the topics deviating from the overall choice, but um, for sea level rise, the Christians had a tie of metaphor one and three, so that one wasn't quite on the trend, it was a little bit different. But um, for example, for wildfires, uh, atheists and the total survey preferred the metaphor that explained when hot weather persists for a long time, plants that live on this land dry out, becoming like unlit matches, so what I mentioned earlier, versus the Christian demographic, adult Christian demographic, preferred with warmer, drier conditions, our forests have a shorter fuse, and a shorter fuse leads to more frequent fires, which will hopefully count 
or so democratic differences. Okay. Um, we, as I mentioned, also asked what childhood religion each of our participants were raised as, but unfortunately we didn't find any real difference in preference according to that. It was pretty overlining with the um, overall top metaphor choices, which we aren't sure was a sample difference, but thus far we're inferring that the differences in ideology and according preferences are stronger between adult practicing religion. That you really hung on to your belief into adulthood and that, that shaped your metaphor more strongly than the core value. Again, I want to stress that this research is ongoing and only descriptive statistics so far, so can't make any general inferences, but hopefully we'll get there. <laughs> Similarly to religion, we also compared generational differences in metaphor preferences, and specifically this table is showing the preferences between boomers and millennials top metaphors, where, as you can see, boomers deviated strongly from the overall top metaphor preferences, while millennials only varied in one response. Um, millennials in the overall survey, when asked about unpredictable weather events, chose the metaphor that explained them like a roller coaster in the dark, versus boomers preferred um, unpredictable weather, weather events to be explained as traffic conditions where you need to be alert and prepared. Uh, This difference was pretty much what we expected, if not a larger difference, to be honest, but we look forward to comparing other generations and getting a larger sample to see if that continues and or is proven to be significant, statistically significant. So for general impacts, implications, why do we care? Um, bridging the knowledge gap and creating understanding and tools to help knowledge to help educate and create more knowledge is going to help us turn audience confusion into enthusiasm and customizing our messages to consider background impacts and get everyone involved. It can cause for more customizability, especially at Noki's over 500 educating partners around the country that are shown on this graph. And just in general, more support and more education means more solutions. So for acknowledgments, Huge thank you to Dr. Tanner and Chapman and Ishan and Dr. Megan Inez, the University of Florida, Noki and Sarah May Nelson. And all of you for listening. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Um, I was really curious. Like I noticed that there was a lot of respondents on each coast. Um, I don't know, like, if you necessarily looked at this, but are there differences in preferences for, for geographical locations, or is that right. something you're going to look at? Oh. This figure is actually Noki's offices. Oh, not, yeah. This sorry. Isn't, I was this like... isn't our distribute. <laughs> okay, we, sorry. I yeah, totally when we accounted that. for um, zip code within demographic differences, we also wanted to try for as even of a distribution as we can. Gotcha. That's why we specifically did not advertise okay. it at China. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about uh, what you do with the metaphors. I think you said something about like for ads and stuff, uh, and for education. But like for like wider thing, would they be on like billboards and like right? Specifically, the research grant that we were functioning under was with Noki and the Noki, the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation, is basically affiliated with. These are all of the zoos, aquariums, museums, and national parks that they're already affiliated with, that they already like distribute scientific resources to, that basically once this research is complete, it's still ongoing, and once we've verified everything, um, we're going to give the metaphors to Noki that this top metaphor table that we intentionally wanted to be like as simple as possible, but they'll get the one with the full metaphor, not just the summary for the presentation, that um, they can use them to educate in the zoos and aquariums and national parks. And, there are broader implications that they could be used elsewhere once like the paper is published, but that's the primary focus. Yeah. How come you didn't look at like political leaning? See, in hindsight, I wish we had asked that to be honest, but it just yeah. wasn't our primary focus at the time, unfortunately, that we could go back and look. <laughs> it impacts the psychology of the survey team. Oh, that is all. Well. That makes sense. More than the other uh, background questions. 
for something like religion, um, yeah. like, is it too broad to say, like, Christians, Jews do something? Because even within religion, there's huge dichotomies. Right. Within religion, this is kind of oversimplified in this category for this graphic, but within religion, we gave, um, we sorted through a bunch of census questions, a bunch of different survey questions all around to find, like, the best identifiable terms. And then within that, we said, we provided the opportunity to, um, have a drop down and fill in. We said, oh, are you a Christian? If so, what type? Are you a Buddhist? What type? Are you this? What type? You type it in. If you're other, type it in. We gave a lot of flexibility for them to like self-identify. Hmm? Um, I noticed you, out of all the respondents, dramatically white. Yes. Um, does that make it difficult to sort of make comparisons between right. different races when it comes to like what they prefer right unfortunately we did notice a large skew with white women i think that a part of that is because noki is largely white women <laughs> but we with each phase of advertising have tried to i don't know if i mentioned that i meant to mention that with each phase of advertising try to target specifically whatever we're lacking mm -hmm. like when our survey was mostly women on our next set of emailing list we emailed only men mm -hmm. we we're trying to get as yeah. much of our <laughs> our, our main majority out of there as yeah. much as possible, but unfortunately, thus far, it has been a little bit skewed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was fantastic. That was really, really good. Um, I have a follow-up question to this sort of challenge of getting the survey out. Mm -hmm. um, if your survey respondents are largely through the Noki network, which makes a ton of sense that right. that's where it all starts. That was only one of our okay. sources. Okay. Our other sources where we emailed out to colleges, we emailed out to religious institutions, we emailed out to colleges email, aquariums, zoos, we targeted some of them directly, not through Noki. And then the Noki people just kind of knew about the yeah, research yeah. and inadvertently distributed it, but also our colleagues at the University of Florida did some more outreach from their side so that we had just more sources. Do you, do you track people who have had Noki training formally in your survey? So I'm curious, you, you should, I mean, one of the things that I found just, the whole thing was cool. Okay. But one of the coolest things is that consistently, it seems like the, the metaphors that you thought shouldn't work, don't right. work. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if I guess what I was wondering is, is how much of that is because you're targeting people that already think about how to effectively right. communicate climate change and have been, in many cases, trained to avoid negative metaphors. Right. Uh, and if you were able to just survey a bunch of people that have no training on how to communicate climate change, but it sounds like you did. So it sounds like even in people that have had no training right. on how to do this right, they still gravitate away from or gravitate towards hope-based messaging. Right. That's really cool. That's yeah. really Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, that was a large part of why we wanted to include our demographic analysis questions, where that we wanted to sort of filter that out. Mm -hmm. And we also, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Taylor, but we also added in a question that had to do with your, um, like, gained knowledge type thing, like a progression question that considered your baseline. And also in our phase of follow-up interviews, we're going to be more specific about explicitly asking for that, that when we're over the phone and when we have more time and don't want to skew like bias within this. Mm -hmm. Really? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.